Welcome. Welcome to the Cultural News Hour. This is the 23rd of May, 2019. We're coming to you from the ICW Cultural Events Center in Salt Lake City. Tonight we're going to talk about Italian family research at home and in Italy. I'm Kathy. I'm Kathy Kirkpatrick. Okay. To start out finding your ancestors, start out in your own home. You've probably got papers and photographs that you're collecting in shoeboxes that you need to organize and scan and pull together. So look at those first. They usually include family papers, photos. You usually have relatives you can interview, interview that old grandmother, the great aunt while she's still around. There's also sometimes newspaper obituaries, wedding announcements, anniversaries, retirements, marriages, birth announcements, all those things that people say over the years. One of those papers might be a naturalization record. When the immigrant naturalized, he got a certificate of naturalization, and that's what he takes home. It's not the same record that you find recorded with the clerk's office or at the court, and it doesn't have as much information, but it's a place to start. Here, you can see it names the court and the date, and the description of the immigrant who's being naturalized and names every one of his minor children, here we go, minor children with their ages and where they're living. And that's him and that's his home address. So that's enough to use to get into the court record to get more information about him. In some people's attics, there's the practice sheet for the naturalization record that they filled out that has more information even than you find on the naturalization petition. So you can see here that Arcangelo Larazza came over from Palermo, but she was born in Caltabalota, here, Caltabalota, and she came from Palermo and she was born in Caltabalota on the 23rd of August, 1888. And her father is Salvatore Razza, and her mother is Berta Ganchi. And then down here, it says the passage was paid by her father, Salvatore Razza, and she was traveling with her mother, Berta Razza, and her three brothers, and it names every one of them. So there's just a ton of information on this document. Sometimes you'll find a family photo album. And this one shows a wedding picture and, and other pictures and the wedding announcement. So the announcement, if you look at it closely, shows that it was published, whoops, in Argento, which used to be called Gugenti, in July of 1908. And somebody wrote in 28 July 1908. So that's probably the wedding date. At least it gives you a really good place to start when you're looking in the civil records. Sometimes you find a retirement announcement. When we zoom in on this, you see that Frank Labella came over when he was 20, yeah, with his bride, and he came from Andrea, Italy. He didn't actually, but it was the right neighborhood and it helped me to locate the right town. Sometimes you can find your ancestors online or information about them. Ancestry is really big on US records, so that's a good place to look for naturalization and census records and all those things that are a good place to start doing your family history. FamilySearch.org is free it's LES, Mormon, but it's not limited to that. An awful lot of people use this website because it's free and it's so available and so open and so easy to access different types of source materials that you can attach to the person that you're researching. Find My Past started out just as British, but it's expanded too. It's a lot more than that now. 
and my heritage started out as Jewish because it's based in Israel, but now it's also much bigger. In fact, this weekend for Memorial Day, they've got a free military records search that includes an awful lot of US records. You can find your ancestors sometimes on live documents regarding census naturalization, passenger arrivals, military records, family trees, and a whole lot more. It's certainly the place to start. This is a census record. And when we zoom in on it, you can see this family, oops, okay, of Gerlando Puleo right here. He's the head, he owns his home, he has a radio, and he's 70 years old, born in Italy, parents born in Italy, but he was 25 when he married. His wife Maria is 54, was 18 when she married, also from Italy. And then you can see the children, Salvatore, Maria, Virginia, Charlie, they're all born in New York, and it gives their ages, and the fact that they're all single and still living at home. And so it gives you a, a picture of what the family was like. You can tell, looking at the other entries, this is mostly an Italian neighborhood, but not completely entirely. Sometimes you can find the passenger arrival, the ship that they came in on and the people they were traveling with. At the bottom of this one, you can see Filippa Sala and coming from Borgio, which is a town in Sicily, and traveling with, now, see, Filippo is only 22, and he's traveling with a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old. So you can kind of assume they might be his siblings, but you're not really sure. They might be other family members, nephews, nieces, cousins. It does say, though, um, that he's leaving behind. Um, now I can't read it. But it does name the person that he's leaving behind in Italy. Lots of times on the New York list on the second page, it says the person that they're going to see. So that's very helpful too. If you go to the ancestral town in Italy, which I highly recommend, there are civil records for marriage and death, but there are also church records, baptism, marriage and death. And sometimes the event that you're looking for is recorded in one or the other and not both, but usually it's recorded in both, which is very handy if there happens to be a war that destroys one of those sets of records. Here you see a photo of the Municipio, the town hall, in San Luca di Sicilia, which is in Agrigento, Agrigento, Provincia. And they have births, marriages, deaths, immigration information, and, and sometimes you can find military records in the Municipio, in the Stato Civile office. Not always, but it's worth looking. It's worth asking. In some offices, the records look like this. They're on wooden bookshelves, which is a little scary to those of us who really like good archives. But at least these are neatly bound and, and, and well done. I have seen them tossed into a closet and in no order whatsoever, and that's truly frightening. Here's the clerk in this town, and you can see there's not a whole lot of separation between church and state in Italy. But that record box behind him, all those wooden boxes that look like the old library card catalogs we hear, they have record cards for each of the citizens of the community showing birth, marriage, and death information. This um, municipio in Santo Stefano Cusquina is in an archival type file cabinet and newly bound books. And so these are in really, really, really good shape, which is very nice to know that the records are being preserved even if they haven't been microfilmed yet. On the birth, you find the names and ages of the parents, occupations, street addresses, and before 1866 in Italy, you'll find a cross-reference to the baptism at the church. In Piverone, I found a birth with notes on the columns that cross-reference the marriage and the death. So here's that record. 
And you can see um, that the birth is reported by a midwife, but it goes down here to say that the child was born to Angela Pagagnano, and it gives her age and who her father is and who the father of the child is and who his father is. In the right column here, it shows that it's Barata Pietro is the child who's born, and it names his parents again, Giuseppe and Angelo Pavignano, and it repeats the birth date. That's the 22nd of September, 1916. The next paragraph is his marriage, and it's in 1947, and it shows um, that he's marrying a woman from another town. And so when it's recorded, it's recorded in part two of the marriages. And that's, it, you're lucky that it got recorded in this town. Often when the marriage occurs in another town, there isn't any record of it in this town. But if, because the marriages occur in the home parish of the Fart. So it's good that it's recorded on this birth record so that we know what town the marriage occurred in. The next paragraph is his death. And he died in Pibarone in 1975. And it even gives the certificate number when it's recorded in the Pibarone records. So all of this, just tons of information, is very helpful. The marriage records show the ages of the bride and groom and the towns where they were born and names their parents and also shows the occupations. And it also shows if their parents are living or dead. So this marriage record is from Luigi Pavignano here. And he married Valentina Octistana. It's a double surname. Um, you can see here that he's a widower and he's 47 years old and a farmer and he's born in Piperone, living in Piperone, and it names his parents, and it says Giovanni is deceased, and his mother, Angela Negri, is also deceased. And then when you go down here to Valentina, she's single, she's 32, she's a homemaker, she's born in this other town, Aurelio, but she's living in Piperone, and so are her parents. Even, um, well, her father, her mother's deceased, the fruit is deceased. So this is all this information on this record. So the, just a treasure trove. This is a death record. This is a standard format that you see in all Italian towns. This one we found in Monte Sant'Angelo. And when you zoom in on it, you can see that um, down here, it shows the death uh, in his own home of Pasquale Costuno in Monte Sant'Angelo, and he's 80 years old, 83, no, 80, Otanta. And he's a laborer, and he's living in this town, and he's living on Strada Grieco. So you know, even you can go look at his house, if, you, if there aren't a whole lot of houses on Strada Grieco. And then it says that he's the son of the late, and this is plural, so plural, so you know that both of his parents are deceased, Antonio Cotuno and Pasqua Saluni. And he's the widower of Giuseppe Principo. So all of that information is documented on this record. Sometimes in the town, you get the full of familia. And it's kind of a, a census record, but they keep it up to date with the births and marriages and deaths of the family, and also their home addresses. You can see on this front page, this is the head of the household, and he died in 1921, but these are the two addresses, and these are the dates when he was living at those addresses. So on the next page, it shows him and his wife and then all their children. And so it shows um, the surname in this column and then the um, given name in this column, and then the name of the father in this column, the name of the mother in this column. On the next page, it shows occupation and the town of, wait, oh, back up. <laughs> 
the town of birth, and the date of birth, and the document number, so you can find it in the registry. And then the same for the marriage, the town of marriage, the date of marriage, and the auto number. The next one has some comments, but mostly it's deaths over in this right column, with the auto numbers as well as the dates, so you know where to find them. And this one is um, additional information, but you can see one of the men who was listed as deceased on the year before, on the page before, um, was in the war in 1917, and that was the cause of his death. Well, he was in the army when he died. He could have died of the flu, but there, it's all there on that information. And then you can, using that, find his death certificate in the town and find out the cause of death. Because even though Italian death records don't normally list the cause of death, the Italian death records that are recorded in part two, because they were turned in by the military and then sent to the town of birth, do show the cause of death. Even if the cause of death is a disease, if he's in the military, it gets recorded. These are the kinds of cards that you would have found in that cabinet with the wooden doors that we saw earlier. So it shows the name of the person. This is Caterina Palermo. And it shows her father's name and her mother's name and the town that she was born in. We're back in Santa Stefano, was Queen Anne And the date that she was born and that she's a homemaker and the name of her husband and his father and the date that they were married and then the date of her husband's death, because over here is her date of death. And then these are the addresses where she lived at. So in a way, it's a lot like the other Folio di Familia that we saw a couple frames ago, but it's a, another recording. They do love their paperwork, which is really good for researchers. This is another Scheda di Familia, and again, you can see this is that Caterina again. So you can see Caterina here and um, that she became the head of the household in 88 when her husband died. And this is the household where she was living. And then it goes on to show all the members of that household. They've all been crossed out because they've all passed away. This is another, and this I'm bringing up because it shows something that you don't see very often. Over here on the left, you can see that he relinquished his Italian citizenship in 1967, I think, yes, in the United States. But on the back side, he reacquired his Italian citizenship in this little town, which is another town, on, in 1996, but it got sent back to his birth town to be recorded. So, just lots and lots of information on these book records. And I went the wrong direction. Okay, the church records, the baptism has the birth date and the parents, marriages have parents and residences, they also have death records in the church, and also the church census, which is called the Stato della Anime. Okay, this is um, the diocese archives in Puglia, and it's just such an extraordinary building, but it uh, is also one of the very few diocese archives that's set up for research, and so truly a treasure, because lots of times you have to go to the church in the little town and find the priest and make an appointment and then you can get in to see the records. These diocese archive repositories are open pretty much all the time, just regular office hours, and you can go in and see what you need to see. Luca is also a wonderful diocese archives and they've got duplicate parish registers of all the parishes in that diocese and a really nice reading room and really a friendly staff. It's one of my favorite places to work. This is a baptism record found in the Luca Diocese archives. And this is 1796, and it names the child being baptized. 
but it shows the day down here, down to the day, and then it describes the child and the child's parents, and just tons and tons of information. Really wonderful records. Yeah, okay. This is a marriage record, and there's a family chart at the bottom because the couple getting married is closer than four degrees apart from the common ancestor. The common ancestor is Nobile, that's his first name. Okay, so on the groom's side, this is Michaela, the groom. He's the father of Santi, who's the son, he's the son of Santi, he's the son of Michaela. Maria Agata, who's the bride, is the daughter of Maria, who's the daughter of Julio, who's a, who's a son of Elisabetta, who's the daughter of Nobile. So you can see how it all connects. But within the document here at the top, it shows that Captain Michaela is the son of Santi, who's the son of the late Michaela Morelli. And one of the reasons you see this is that this town has so many people with the same names that you can't just say the groom is the son of so-and-so. You have to say the groom is the son of this man who's the son of this man. And the same thing with the bride and the Casalas here further down. So this is a death record, and this is one of those where you do see all those generations. Here's the Giuseppe Francesco, who's the son of Giovanni Angelo, who's the son of Giovanni Caselli from the town of Gignano. So all of that, you've got four generations right there, all on one record, which is wonderful. I love these records. Okay, this is a Stato della Anime. This is what we were calling a church census. And so this is, it's, it's set up by the household. So this is the Pigotti household. And here's Domenico, who's the son of Antonio and Maria Berte. So he lists both parents of the head of the household. And then the birthday. And then Domenico's wife, Rosanna Iannucci, and wife, and her birthday. And then Michaela D'Antonio. So Michaela is the brother of Domenico. And you can see too here, he's born in 23 and Domenico's born in 18. So then there's Michaela's wife, and she's, it shows her father. And then um, another, this is a sister to these two brothers, who's also a child of Antonio, and this sister's born in 32. So 1823, 32, they're all siblings in the same family. And then as you go down, this is Maria Teresia Caterina Giudita. She's got a lot of first names. She's a daughter of Domenico, this man up here. But this Michaela de Vida Giuliano Gaetano, again, a lot of first names, is the son of Michaela, the second man who was mentioned. And then Florinda is another child of Michaela, a daughter. So you've really got two families living in this house, the families of two brothers plus their sister. Sometimes the provincial archives are hard to find. I go down the street looking for the flags hanging over the door. That doesn't always work, but it usually works. In these provincial archives, you'll find military lists, town records, birth, marriage, death, Rivelli Catasti, which is the census tax records, and land records. This is um, out of a different provincial archives, Cosenza. Um, it's a tax list, and so it shows the names of the heads of household on the left and the amount of land that's being taxed and the amount of tax. Oh. Okay, military records. Lista de Leva is a conscription list, and it's based on birth records, and most often, the birth records are recorded in the civil records, but sometimes they're only recorded in the church records, but it doesn't matter. Either way, the least of your label will pick them up, and you will find your guy in here. So, this shows everybody gets a name, 
a number on the list of Ileva, and that number follows you throughout your military career, which is very handy if there's a bunch of guys with the same name from the same town, because then you know it's this guy, and he's got the right parents. Because here, you see his name, here's his father, and his mother, and his birth date, and the town where he's born, all of that information right here. So you'll be sure you have the right man. On the next page, there's a physical description of him and his occupation. And then it says he was visited by a delegation from Bari because he moved from this little town in Cosenza, Provincia, up to a little town in Bari, Provincia. But the military found him when it was time for him to join the army because the conscription is mandatory. Okay, cemetery records, also a treasure trove. Um, family members, because lots of times there are multiple burials in the same location. Births, deaths, and photos. I, this is an old photo, so it's a little out of focus. It's 20 years old, but it was just a delightful cemetery to visit. My kid resists tossing it in. This is a section of a cemetery outside Milano that shows um, fallen soldiers and resistance fighters from World War I and World War II in Campo. So here, these are the um, soldiers from World War I, and here are the um, partisans, the resistance fighters from World War II, and here are the soldiers from World War II. So it's this combination of things that you find in, these people are not from this town, or they would be buried with other family members. But this is where they fell, and so this is where they're buried. Particularly in World War I, they are not transporting bodies back to the hometown for burial, as they did more often in World War II. This is another family cemetery, and that's my sister, finding her husband's family here. So here, this is the family, and oh, right. this is the woman she's looking for, Margarita Baba, because she's sister to Remigio, who came to the United States and became the great-grandfather of her husband, Stephen. But this is all of the family members and, and all the dates and the photos. So you can see how they look and, and how they're all related all in one, in one cripta, in one little chapel. Okay. Uh, looks a lot like the last picture, close up. Okay, sometimes in, you find information about families in the local history museum. This is uh, the Mezia Terme, which is really a cluster of towns, and the central town is Nicostro. So, and it, it says uh, Archaeological Museum Lamentino, but because it's Lamentino. But I put Nicastro at the top because that's the little town that it's in the middle of. Okay. Yes. Okay, so touring through the town of Nicastro, we come to the Jewish quarter. And you can see it's below street level, and it's got a gate to go in. But these people weren't locked behind the gate. They used the gate to keep other people out on occasion, but they were never locked in. There's a sign that says this is the area of the Jews, and in this quarter worked the industrious community of Jews from the 13th to the 16th century. The sign was put up by Lamezia Terme, the town, in 2004. So there's a, a growing recognition of some of these little communities and signs going up. And there's our tour guide, Rabbi Barbara, with me and my son James. And standing in the Jewish quarter right near the river and looking up toward the castle where Federico II reigned with, with a kind hand toward the Jewish community and is well remembered. Some of the local traditions, you can see, um, this is a funeral 
announcement that's not. It's 30 days after the funeral, so there's a special mass being said um, in the local Catholic church. This is also a Jewish tradition, so it's good to know that the history comes from more history. This is a Jewish church that became um, a Catholic. It's a Jewish synagogue that became a Catholic church, right. So, in the process, they took this window, which used to be a Star of David, rounded some of the corners, and now it's a Catholic church. Kind of entertaining. You don't want to tear the whole building down. Sometimes on our travels, we get to meet with our clients. This is um, me and my sister, and my daughter, and our client, Adrian, and his mom is taking the photo. This is at a hotel in Rome. We're having a good time. Sometimes I get to help people meet their cousins. This is an American girl and her Italian cousin sharing the stories. And they're part of this family. This is her again and her dad and then their whole Italian family. And that's the patriarch Giovanni, which leads to another story. These two little boys are the first sons of Giovanni's sons. So they are also named Giovanni. Right. So here we are, and, and the women are in the kitchen, and they're preparing dinner, and the two little boys are racing around the dining room table. One of the moms comes out of the kitchen and says, Giovanni, and all three of them come to attention, the two little boys and the granddad. What? What? So it was pretty funny. Upcoming events, um, the Transcontinental Railroad in Utah is a book that I wrote talking about how the railroad brought different groups of people into Utah and, um, and the process of building the railroad, all the railroad stops coming through Utah. Um, it will be released the 27th, today's the 23rd, so it's coming up. Okay, next month we're talking about um, military burials in the US and Europe, and that will also be at this location. Um, the June 27th, July 25th. Okay, that's a mistake. So on June 27th, we're talking about the Transcontinental Railroad. And in July, we're talking about the military records. And then in July, I go to Cleveland to talk about military records again. And then in August, we'll talk about POW camps. And then at the end of August, the next POW camp book comes out, number six in the series, um, number five in the series, Prisoner of War Camps in Washington and Oregon. So that concludes tonight's presentation. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next month. Thank you.